Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I want to welcome you to this event on atrocity prevention in the real world, a tale of four countries. It's very helpful when it's up there. Um, you know, uh, it's sort of been uh, the season for uh, miracles. We uh, commemorated both uh, the Exodus and the Resurrection, and for me, number three is getting Don Steinberg here this term. So uh, I'm really uh, delighted uh, that he uh, is this year's Bildner Family Distinguished uh, Fellow in International Affairs, and uh, is also teaching in our International Studies program a course entitled The Challenge of Global Poverty, Why It Matters, and what we can do about it. Um, if I were to recite all of uh, Don's qualifications to give this talk or to teach that course, we, I would take all of his time, and I don't want to do that. Um, most recently, he was uh, Chief Executive Officer of World Learning, an institution known uh, to everyone in, in the North Country because of its longtime outpost in, in Brattleboro. Um, he has spent more than 35 years in government, uh, most recently as deputy director of USAID, uh, where he focused on the Middle East and Africa, organizational reforms, uh, the inclusion of women, people with disabilities, LGBT persons, and other marginalized groups in the development arena. And needless to say, he also spent a lot of time uh, expanding our, our interaction, our dialogue with our, with our development partners around the world. Um, I, when I first met uh, Don Steinberg, he was the National Security Council Senior Director from, for Africa, uh, which seemed like um, the hardest job on earth at the time. He had already been the Deputy Press Secretary in the White House, dealing with national security uh, uh, affairs. Uh, he has also been uh, our Special Coordinator for Haiti, uh, Ambassador to Angola, uh, the President's Special Representative for Humanitarian Demining, and outside of government, he was Deputy President for Policy at uh, one of the most impressive organizations I believe we have in the NGO world, the International Crisis Group. He's written more than 100 articles uh, on, a, on a wide range of uh, subjects and in an equally wide range of uh, publications. Um, before he uh, acquired all this renown, he was, uh, he, he he acquired master's degrees in journalism from Columbia University, uh, another one in political economy from the University of Toronto, and he holds uh, a bachelor's degree from uh, Reed College, where from a long time in Washington, I know most of the, many of the very smartest people come. So uh, it's really a delight to welcome him here, and uh, thank you so much for turning out to hear this. Thank you. Time. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Uh, it is really a privilege to be here today uh, and to serve as the Bildner Fellow uh, this spring. I've been here all of a week now, and I am already wondering why I waited so long to start my academic career. Uh, I do want to thank Dan, Tom Condon, and uh, uh, the Dickey Center for this opportunity. I also want to salute their work in helping to prepare the students of Dartmouth and beyond to be global citizens. In a world that's facing rising levels of xenophobia, isolationism, militarism, protectionism, and I'm not just talking about the White House. Uh, this is the most important work we can do. You draw on outstanding scholars and students and advocates, and the center actually serves as the eyes, the ears, and the conscience, not only of the Dartmouth community, but of the global community. Rest assured that I did not plan a career dominated by mass atrocities. I actually can't imagine anyone who would. I was born into a Jewish family in Southern California just eight years after the end of World War II, but the Holocaust seemed far away and long ago. I do remember at the age of 12 uh, learning about the Holocaust and I asked my father how he could still believe in a God that would allow it to happen. 
He didn't have a good answer. Nobody does. But he said that even as they were being taken to the concentration camps, Jews reaffirmed their belief in God. He said that if they could do so, what right did he have to use their suffering and tragedy to abandon his? Growing up, I wanted to fight global poverty, to defend human rights, to end war, little things like that. And I've been fortunate to work on these challenges in more than 120 countries for the past four decades, but mass atrocities have been a constant companion. Indeed, if you spend your life in this arena, at least one Syrian event, a Rwanda, a Cambodia, a Bosnia, will demand your courage, test your skills, and challenge your faith in humanity. It's now become a ritual for each new U.S. president to travel to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and say two words. In 2007, George W. Bush said, the words never again do not refer to the past. They refer to the future, and it's our work to make it impossible for the world to turn a blind eye. Five years later, I was with Barack Obama when he said, remembrance without resolve is a hollow gesture. Never again challenges us to pause and to look within. And last April, Donald Trump said, today we mourn, we remember, we pray, and we pledge never again. Frankly, I wish he'd say the same thing about gun violence in the United States, but I digress. <laughs> These are all nice words, but you look at the world today, and we have to ask some tough questions. Doesn't never again apply to Syria? to Yemen, to Eastern Congo, to South Sudan? Where are our moral courages and our political will to act? Are our presidents, and by extension, are we hypocrites? I'd like to try to address some of these questions by recounting some experiences that I've had from my work in Africa, and in particular, South Africa, Kenya, Somalia, and Rwanda, and then draw some lessons. In spring of 1990, I went to serve at the US Embassy in South Africa, arriving just after Nelson Mandela strode out of prison. Apartheid was in its death throes, but many feared a bloody civil war of vengeance that would pit Kosa, Zulus, whites, and others against each other. Thankfully, these observers didn't count for the leadership and the vision of Mandela, Archbishop Tutu, F.W. de Klerk, and others. Mandela had called for the world to help the ANC move from a resistance movement to a government able to deal with a complex society and a complex past. He was grateful for the past adoption of economic sanctions to help end apartheid, but now he called for positive engagement to build reconciliation and a strong, stable post-apartheid society. My job was working with Mandela's economic advisors to train them in land reform, in anti-monopoly policy, and affirmative action. Much of that training was going to be overseas, and Mandela's team said, we don't want to leave at this time. This is too exciting a period. They wouldn't listen to me, so Mandela called them together. And I will always remember the meeting where he said, look, we have time. Because he said, I don't plan to become president of South Africa for four years. His team all said, Mandiba, you could walk today into the Parliament House and take over. And he responded with these words, yes, we could seize power now, but if we did, we would inherit the wind. The whites and others don't trust us because they know we have bitterness in our hearts. 
Moses took the Israelites for 40 years in the desert to cleanse themselves before they could enter the promised land. If they could take 40 years, we can take four. <coughs> Remember, this is a man who just spent 25, 26 years in prison, and he emerges with this kind of realization and this kind of vision. And indeed, he implemented it. He carried out a well-planned charm campaign to calm the whites and the non-Kosa population, and especially their security forces. He ensured the full ethnic representation in the new transitional government, parliament, and provinces. He insisted on a power-sharing relationship that limited his own party's ability to change the Constitution. He emphasized truth and reconciliation rather than vengeance through Desmond Tutu's innovative commission and he even became the top fan of the Afrikaners' favorite rugby team, the Springboks, a story that's told in the remarkable book and movie Invictus. We in the world responded with assistance, investments, a wealth of often contradictory advice, and most of all, goodwill and encouragement. And while tens of thousands of lives were indeed lost over the next few years, a bloodbath was averted. And indeed, it was precisely four years later that Mandela became president of a country that was well on its way to reconciliation and healing. It was Mandela's inspired, forward-thinking, and moral leadership that made the difference. Regrettably, we can't always rely on once-in-a-lifetime figures like Mandela and Tutu to save the day. And I learned this lesson soon thereafter when I went to serve as, at the White House as the Deputy Press Secretary and Advisor for Africa for Bill Clinton. That period for me was dominated by the witch's brew of war and death in Somalia and Rwanda. In 1997, American, excuse me, 1993, American soldiers were in Somalia delivering life-saving assistance and food to hundreds of thousands of people who were faced with a famine that had already cost a quarter of a million lives and threatened twice that number. But in contrast to a leader like Mandela, warlords like Mohammed Adid were thwarting the relief effort and profiting from the suffering. You all remember when U.S. Army Rangers tried to capture a deed, 18 of them were killed, and they were dragged through the streets of Mogadishu in what we now know as Black Hawk Down. Regrettably, neither the Bush administration that had started the program nor our administration had really articulated to the American people what we were doing in Somalia. And there was a firestorm of criticism, mostly from Capitol Hill. President Clinton initially stayed the course, but then the pressure got so great that he decided to withdraw all of our forces over the next six months. And when the withdrawal was completed the following March, I traveled with the president to Fort Drum, New York, where the Rangers had been stationed. I have to be honest with you, this picture is not actually from that trip, <laughs> but if you had a picture of yourself in the private office on Air Force One with the president trying to make you smile, you'd show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I digress again. At Fort Drum, the president wanted to explain to the troops and the family members why their comrades and loved ones had died in a far off African country. And he said the following, our actions in Somalia were a great victory, measured in the hundreds of thousands of people who are alive today. The mission you undertook was without precedent. Our soldiers didn't go to Somalia to conquer, but on a mission of mercy, a mission accomplished, a mission to be proud of, let history record that. The problem was that he said this at the end, 
and not the beginning to explain why we were there. And while there was much truth in these words, you could see from the angst in the president's face that he knew history would judge us very differently and would re record the Somalia engagement as a failure that couldn't be repeated elsewhere. Regrettably, a few weeks later, in early April 1994, a plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi was shot down in Kigali, starting the Rwandan genocide. Soon after, 10 Belgian peacekeepers were murdered in a conscious effort to scare off Western forces, and it worked. Like many colleagues, including Madeleine Albright, Tony Lake, Susan Rice, and President Clinton himself, I will always regret that we just assumed the American people, still shaken by Somalia, wouldn't support the use of American forces to stop the genocide. And it was important to note that there wasn't a single senator, congressman, or major politician during that period who was calling for American intervention. Still, we could have done so much more than we did. Some of us proposed that we jam the Genesidaires radio station, Mill Colleen, which was calling for the extermination of all Tutsis, labeling them as cockroaches. We could have provided Romeo Dallaire, who was the head of the UN forces, with new support. And we could have pressed African countries to provide a protective force to save as many lives as possible. But each time we pressed for those steps, the system pushed back. Others on the National Security Council would ask, where's the public outcry? Where's the hallelujah chorus of support from Congress and civil society that we'll need when the going gets rough? If American troops lose their lives again, won't it doom peacekeeping forever? And so, the jamming of hate speech on Mil Colleen was caught up in a legal debate as to whether it was legal to do this and violate free speech and international law. We had to talk about whether you were allowed to call for the extermination of 10% of your population as a question of free speech. When we shipped 50 armored personnel carriers to Uganda for Dallaire's forces, the UN wouldn't accept them because they were painted military green and not UN peacekeeping white. The UN refused to paint the APCs in Uganda. They were sent back to Germany and they didn't arrive until it was all over. When Vice President Al Gore, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and I went to Southern Africa in May of 1994 to urge African peacekeepers to go in, we were thwarted by the lack of trained forces and by disputes over who was going to pay for it. Time and time again, the forces of an action triumphed until 800,000 lives were lost. This shameful response imposed on all of us a lifetime commitment to learn the lessons of Rwanda, Somalia, and other tragedies and apply them wherever we could. I left the White House shortly thereafter to become ambassador to Angola, where the warring parties had just signed a peace agreement to end 25 years of civil war that cost a half million lives and left three million people homeless. For four years, I worked with my colleagues from the United Nations, Russia, and Portugal in a torturous process that ultimately succeeded. Since then, I've been involved in conflict prevention and peace building in areas like South Sudan, Darfur, Haiti, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. And let me say, I am actually very encouraged by a lot of progress we've achieved since the 1990s, especially in the area of legal norms, of global scholar uh, structures, and international behavior. We now have the Rome Statute and the International Criminal Court to help define and hold accountable those 
who have committed crimes against humanity. At the United Nations in 2005, every country endorsed the doctrine of responsibility to protect, which says that if a nation can't or won't protect its citizens, the responsibility to respond shifts to the global community. The United Nations has formed its Peace Building Commission, and I had the honor to be a founding member of the White House Atrocity Prevention Board, a sub-cabinet government commission set up uh, during the Obama administration to mobilize the interagency and to keep a watchful eye on emerging crises. Further, we now have more than 200,000 peacekeepers from the United Nations and other operations who are deployed to stop violence. NATO and its allies responded in Libya and Kosovo, the UK in Sierra Leone, France and Cote d'Ivoire in Mali, and the African Union in Darfur. And I'm proud that governments and donors alike now recognize that socioeconomic growth and advancement and resiliency can be a vaccine against instability that can lead to atrocities. In 2008, the Holocaust Museum asked Madeleine Albright and Bill Cohen to head a task force to develop a game plan to prevent atrocities before they began. I was an advisor to that task force along with Ben Valentino, and we both worked on the area of early warning. And he actually knew what he was doing, as opposed to me who had just seen a lot of it on the ground. Early warning means how do you identify root causes that often lead to mass atrocities? And it was in this context that we proposed seven factors at that point, and Ben is now researching to come up with a much more sophisticated set of factors. But at that point, we talked about the seven factors that could lead to mass atrocities if you brought them together. And we called them the seven deadly synergies. That was me who came up with that one. <laughs> ben opposed it. So These are what they are. Uh, so the first challenge is rapid urbanization and population pressure co uh, coupled with weak economies. If young people don't see an opportunity to contribute to the success of their societies, they are susceptible to the siren song of fanatics and zealots. Second is the lack of political participation, responsive governance, and rule of law. Societies need safety valves for the peaceful redress of grievances. The third factor is the absence of institutions of civil society that draw people together across potentially divisive religious, ethnic, regional, and ideological lines. The next factor I call location, location, location. Countries in bad neighborhoods risk meddling and spillover from armed combatants, refugees, and weapons flow. Those in good neighborhoods take advantage of a powerful dampening effect on violence. Fifth is what I call the normalization of violence. Every society has pressures and conflicts based on race and ethnicity and religion. In this society, are they resolved by dialogue and compromise, or in the presence of a gun or a machete? Sixth is the extent to which the society, the economy, and the media are open or closed. Mass atrocities are like mushrooms. They grow best in darkness. Finally, the past record is indeed an indicator of future performance, as opposed to what you hear on prospectuses. The most reliable determinant as to whether a society will face a mass atrocity in the future is whether they've had one in the past 10 years. So these lessons were taken into account in fighting 
violence on the ground following a failed presidential election in Kenya. In late 2007 and then subsequently in 2008, a bad election led to this kind of violence on the ground. At the time, I was indeed the pres a deputy president at International Crisis Group, which is an advocacy and research nonprofit committed to resolving deadly conflict. And we saw the danger signs. And I sent an alert throughout our global network, which read, the burning of the church in Eldoret with three dozen Kikuyus inside, the history of ethnic violence in the Rift Valley, and the hate speech among Kikuyus, Kalinjans, and Luau's take this crisis out of normal post-electoral tensions and puts it squarely onto the atrocity prevention stage. While the parallels between Kenya and Rwanda can be easily overdrawn, deterioration in other seemingly solid African countries like Cote d'Ivoire and Zimbabwe could easily be repeated in Kenya to tragic effect. It's time to sound the alarm bells. So what does successful atrocity prevention look like? Well, first, it demands committed leadership. And in this case, Kofi Annan, Ben Nkapa, and Grasa Michelle were the leaders. And that isn't Grasa, but uh, they led a mediation backed by the United States, the EU, and the United Nations. And I have to pay tribute here to Johnny Carson, Ambassador who was part of the effort that uh, kept this thing under control there. I, too, from the private sector, from the NGO community, was part of the team advising them. But for those who suggest that atrocity prevention is something that we in the West care about, and we're forcing it on the global South, please note that these leaders were men and women from Ghana, Tanzania, and Mozambique. They negotiated a power sharing arrangement to end the immediate crisis, but then instead of turning their collective gaze away and allowing the underlying problems to fester, the world stayed engaged. We demanded constitutional reforms to reduce the president's power and strengthen the Supreme Court and the parliament. We insisted on accountability for post-electoral violence, the dismantling of ethnic militias, and training for security forces and non-lethal crowd control. We launched an assistance program called Yes Youth Can, which brought together more than a million young Kenyans to dialogue across ethnic divisions and resist group violence. And it worked. The result was a major decline in violence in the next elections that came five years later. Kenya hadn't just dodged a bullet in 2008. It built a more democratic and inclusive society. And while the elections just this past year suffered some similar challenges, it's important that institutions like the Supreme Court and like Parliament stepped forward to ensure that there would be no repeat of the same kind of violence. This experience taught me that it is indeed possible to make a difference. For the last five years, I've been working at a group called World Learning, which helps empower leaders in a number of countries abroad to combat the root causes of mass atrocities. Our Excuse me, this is the Yes Youth Can movement and one of the rallies that they held in, in Kenya. At World Learning, we have a, trans a conflict transformation program that trains leaders and peace builders from 60 countries around the world through a powerful process of study, self-reflection, community building with an emphasis on identity, dynamics, stereotyping, dehumanization, and social psychology. And these are some of the people who teach there. It's impressive that we have had four Nobel Prize, Peace Prize laureates 
engaged with our program over the last 20 years. Jody Williams, who led the global fight to ban lion mines. Wangari Matai, who started the Greenbelt Movement for Women's Rights and Environmental Protection in Kenya and beyond. Tawakar Karman, who stood up for press freedom and gender equality in Yemen. And Khalish Satyarthi, who advocates for children's rights in India and beyond. So, what lessons do we draw from these experiences? And in particular, what lessons are there for us as civil society and as academics? First, it's my view that in our work in vulnerable countries, whether we are exchange visitors, Fulbright professors, human rights advocates, or even tourists, we need to watch for the warning signs of ethnic violence civil society abuse, electoral disputes, and other stressors that can lead to mass atrocities. There's no single route to violence. There's no single game plan to stop it. But monitoring the factors that I cited before is a good start. And let me stress, when we see something, we need to say something. Second, our most important work is rarely in countries that are impacted and already on the global radar screen, like Sudan, Syria, Yemen, the Rohingya in Myanmar. There's already attention to those issues, but we need to keep a watchful eye and sound alarms on what are called high-risk, low-attention sites, the Horn of Africa, the Mano River states in East in West Africa, Sri Lanka, uh, the Central Asian states, the Andes, the uh, Northern Triangle in Central America. Third, we need to harness new technologies so that we make the fight against atrocities a whole of society exercise. We have new technologies, we have social media, we have 6.5 billion cell phones that can share information about threats more quickly and broadly. At USAID, for example, we funded voice recognition systems that monitor and target hate speech. We did data mining exercises that revealed hidden relationships related to preparations for atrocities. We generated new ideas from tech users through open data, through crowdsourcing, data paloozas, and hackathons. Finally, my fourth conclusion is that impunity as a blanket gift must be a thing of the past. When you fail to hold abusers accountable for atrocities committed under the guise of war, you create a cancer at the heart of your society. Amnesty too often means that men with guns forgive other men with guns for crimes committed against women and children. And let me repeat that. Men with guns forgive other men with guns for crimes committed against women and children. Whether it's through the International Criminal Court, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission like Desmond Tutu ran, regional tribunals or local structures like the Kachasha system in Rwanda, we need to demand justice and accountability for the most marginalized populations, including women, people with disability, the LGBTI community, indigenous populations, and ethnic and religious minorities. So to conclude, when I shared the draft for this afternoon with Samantha Power, with Freedom House President Mike Abramovitz, with the foreign, uh, former NSC Senior Director Steve Pomper and others, they all told me I had a problem, that the elephant in the room was the world's failure to respond in Syria. They warned that the first question that you were going to ask me was, how can you speak of progress in this area with Syria staring us in the face? 
So I'm going to preempt that and answer that question in advance, and I acknowledge my comments are going to be inadequate. First, all of the steps that I've described so far in South Africa and Kenya and elsewhere benefited from political will <coughs> to take action. As advocates, I believe that we need to build that same political will to act in even the tougher cases like Syria. We have to remind our fellow citizens that genocide prevention isn't just a moral calling, although it is a moral calling. It is also in our national interest. I believe it is equally important as nukes in North Korea, as ISIS in Iraq, or climate change. Countries where atrocities are present are more likely to harbor terrorists. They are more likely to traffic in drugs and people in weapons to incubate and transmit pandemic diseases, to send refugees across borders and oceans, to require huge spending in humanitarian assistance, and to require American boots on the <coughs> ground. Further, when we take a pass during mass atrocities, we lose our moral authority to exercise soft power. Even if our actions are inadequate or have uncertain consequences, we must never be silent bystanders. Individuals can make a difference uh, globally and locally. For example, here in New Hampshire, advocates have insisted that the Holocaust and genocide be taught in the state's public school curriculum courses very similar to those that the Parkland students were studying when the tragedy occurred. I also do indeed want to pay tribute to Ben Valentino and the work that he's doing in this area. He is a leader in not only this community, but in the global community uh, in atrocity prevention. My second response to the question of how I can be hopeful still goes back to the talk I had with my dad 50 years ago. After our talk about the Holocaust, he had me read Elie Wiesel's chilling book, Night, in which Wiesel shares his story of courage and perseverance. And I will tell you, this is a really heady experience for a 12-year-old. At one point in the book, Wiesel calls himself out for supposed cowardice in confronting the death of his own father, even as he awaited his own anticipated death at Buchenwald. In 2009, Wiesel led Barack Obama and Angela Merkel on a trip to Buchenwald. And at the end of the speech, he said the following words, and these are not the following words. I'm about to read you the following words. He said, we had the right to give up, to give up on humanity and on culture, to give up on education and the possibility of living one's life with dignity in a world that has no place for dignity. But we rejected that possibility. We said, no, we must continue to believe in a future to stare into the abyss, to face the darkness and insist that there is a future, to say yes to life, to believe in the possibility of justice. Once again, my deepest thanks for the opportunity to share these thoughts with you. I look forward to your questions and comments, and thank you for listening. And I did make uh, a request in advance that all questions be true or false. <laughs> <laughs> or you can do multiple choice if you give me an E, none of the above. <laughs> And for students in my class, 
this is a no fault arena. So ask <laughs> ask the toughest questions you can. <laughs> Just in case I'm being graded on this. Um, I actually wanted to ask regarding the legal terms. Um, in the international community, we lack the 911 or, you know, the international cop that holds powers, whether they're great or small, accountable. And given America's track record of sometimes contradicting international law and um, especially when it comes to smaller nations uh, and Russia taking, you know, the Kosovo precedent um, in certain cases, how can we, like, as members of the international community, reconcile our own track record and, as you said, um, maintain moral authority or mm -hmm. soft power while dealing with these cases and discrepancies? So the key here is to have an actual definition of what mass atrocities are, and it is in the criminal court, the Rome Statute, and it talks about crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and it includes ethnic cleansing, which is not really a clear definition, but it, it is the latter. Then, the, then you have to go through in order to justify intervention according to the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, a whole series of questions. The question is, what is your real purpose for engaging? So when the Russians went into Georgia, they claimed that they were doing this to protect Russian ethnic citizens in that region. When they took over Crimea, they claimed that this was in response to responsibility to protect and this same initiative. But the reality is very different. The same is true if we look at the cases that I'm talking about here. It is instructive that we acted in Kenya. Why did we act in Kenya? And Johnny Carson probably knows this better than anyone else because it's really an important country for us. It is a regional hub for humanitarian assistance. It is a regional transport for trade throughout East Africa. They cooperate with us on uh, issues of terrorism. Uh, they are a seemingly successful society that if they fail, what does that say to other countries? So there is no purity involved in this exercise. You're always going to have national interests that kick in at the same time that you're trying to save lives. But at the core, the question becomes, can the country involved meet its responsibility to protect its own citizens? And if they are unwilling or unable to do so, it is the responsibility of the international community. Now, wherever possible, we need to act in accordance with the United Nations. And that, for me, is the regulator. So that when we looked at engagement, for example, in Libya with protecting Benghazi when the Libyan forces were moving on that city, we got a UN Security Council resolution. We brought Arab countries into the discussion and into the coalition. And so there was a justification for that that you could cite. When we moved in Kosovo, it was actually opposed to UN regulations, but there had been uh, resolutions prior to that that said, yes, you have to end the ethnic cleansing that's occurring in Kosovo. So wherever you can, getting an international imprimatur on what you're trying to do is, is absolutely important. And you know, just because we have sinned in the past doesn't mean we have to sin in the future. And I mean that quite seriously. You can establish any precedent you want, and you can learn from your past mistakes, or you can establish them as precedents to give you the excuse not to act. And that's one position I never want to be in. We must never be a bystander to mass atrocities and genocide. I'll give you one last example. When I was working with uh, Colin Powell, and Johnny was a part of this exercise as well, we had what was going on in Darfur. 
we knew that we had a limited capability to respond to it. But I was part of the group that declared, yes, this is genocide. And we thought it was important for the United States to be on record as saying genocide is occurring when the Genjuid are attacking ethnic minorities there. It didn't mean that we responded as well as we should have. It didn't build in and of itself the political will to take action. But it was important to be able to put ourselves on record in that regard, as we didn't do in Rwanda until very, very late in that process. And those of you who remember Rwanda remember that we refused to call it genocide for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then we decided we would call it acts of genocide. And then finally, the president came out six weeks later and said, you know, when 800,000 people from a particular race are killed, that's probably genocide. When you were speaking about the lessons to draw from, from the past several decades of atrocity prevention, um, you spoke about the need to do away with um, amnesty and impunity. Um, but, but is amnesty sometimes necessary to forge power sharing agreements? I, I'm thinking specifically of South Sudan where no side is uninvolved in atrocities. This is one of the single toughest questions that you can ask. And because I have dealt with this, I'm sure Dan has dealt with this. You know, every American diplomat thinks about this. No, you do not set a blanket rule that no amnesties are allowed. That would be ridiculous. There are situations, and I will tell you, I argued for many, many years that in Zimbabwe, we should have said to Robert Mugabe and his generals, you're amnesty for anything you did. I don't care what you did in Matabele land. You're free to go off. Because for the society as a whole, it would have led to probably 10 years less of repression and decline in the society than you would have had. I was ripped apart by human rights advocates for proposing that, but I still to this day believe it was right. In Angola, when I was ambassador, we were negotiating peace agreements and trying to keep the parties committed to the process. Every now and again, we would go out and we would see killing fields where there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of bodies that were killed in the process. And these were not war victims. These were victims of mass atrocities. We knew at that point that the peace process was so fragile that if we did full investigations and held people accountable for actions at that point, we would be back at civil war. And remember, that civil war cost a half million lives and left three million people homeless. So what did we do? We sent out people to collect the samples, to protect the evidence. And then we said, this is going to be addressed when this society is strong enough in order to address it without going back to war. I'll give you another example in Angola. The president of the country has just left after, what, 35, 40 years. He was the longest serving president. We know, as a global community, that he's done some pretty bad things. We know that he's done bad things vis-a-vis -vis corruption. I mean, his daughter is the richest woman in, I think, the world right now, if not Africa, because of the oil money that she's been able to uh, glean off. And yet, were we to have said to the president, oh, by the way, the day after you leave, you're going to be back in, you're going to be back in the same palace, but now you're going to be in the prison of that palace, you never would have gotten the movement. So there is, a re there is a realism that has to kick in. And there are people who have walked through this process. There is an 18-volume book that seeks to answer the question that you just asked. 
uh, and I'm assigning it to you for your class. So, uh, but, but the basic point is blanket amnesties that say we forgive you for anything that you have done in the past do create the sense that this peace process isn't for the people. It suggests it's for the people with the guns. In the Angolan process, and I felt awful about this, when I got out there, I realized that not only had we amnestied the parties for anything they had done in the past, there was one provision that said, anything you do over the next nine months, you will be amnestied for. So it was like a get out of free, a jail free card that we were handing them. And I will tell you that we had problems with the peace process because our civil society activists said, this isn't for us. You're doing the peace process for the men with the guns. You know, where is our interest being reflected? And it did indeed put a cancer at the heart of the process. I said that it was ultimately successful, but it took much, much longer and much more suffering throughout the country than it would have if we had held them accountable, gotten civil society engaged as a pressure point and an advocate for the peace process to remain. I could go on, but I think that's probably fine. notices something happening should report them. To whom should they report them? You said including tourists. That's there, the easy question. Well, that uh, no, and it's a straightforward question. Right now, most diplomats who go out to countries that we are concerned about the possibility of mass atrocities get training <laughs> in atrocity prevention and to look out for what they see. It isn't silly to say you can go to the local embassy. We have the Atrocity Prevention Board in Washington. We have, in effect, an open line that is there. And we do, and, and we reach out primarily to human rights groups who know what, you know what they're looking for and what they're doing. So Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and Physicians for Human Rights. And those groups regularly come into the Atrocity Prevention Board. For example, they were the ones who highlighted for us two and a half years ago what was about to happen with the Rohingya. And you may not remember this, but Barack Obama, in his first visit to Myanmar, used that information to say to the leadership, we're watching you. And the steps that we're prepared to take to enhance your transition here, we're not going to take if you proceed with the plans that, that you've identified. Now, as I've said in the past, it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it obviously did not. But there, there are ample opportunities to, uh, to reflect, uh, you know, if, and, and again, if you, I, I know this sounds very silly, but if you're walking in a small village and you see 50,000 machete in a storeroom, you can be pretty sure that something's going on. And let me say, people saw that in Rwanda. And the failure of us as the powers that be at that point to respond to what was being said to us is something that we'll live with for the rest of our lives in, in shame. But, you know, Romeo Dallaire was sending back notes saying, hey, guys, you sent me out here with 2,000 peacekeepers lightly armed. I can't do it because I'm seeing importing of weapons. I'm seeing hate speech. I'm seeing mobilization at local levels. It's... Uh, Hopefully, we've gotten better now. But uh, that's the response to that one. And now you're going to okay. hit me with the hard one. OK, so well, no, that's the third. Um, truth and reconciliation is not that 
You don't consider that amnesty? No, but, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, I consider truth and reconciliation uh, processes uh, perfectly legitimate if that's what the society and all the different players in the society buy into. In South Africa, you had so many situations where people would come forward and acknowledge on both sides. I mean, the ANC was not blameless. The PAC was not blameless on their side. They would come forward, and it was gut-wrenching to have to say what you had done to explain the motivation, et cetera. But the society said to itself, we care as much about reconciliation as we do about justice in this instance. And if the aggrieved party says that this is an acceptable process, for the most part, and there are exceptions, but for the most part, I consider that to be legitimate. There are some cases where the aggrieved party can accept something that is counter to any real sense of justice. You know, you look at honor killing type situations and whatever, and there's no, I, I do not accept that. So I just want you to talk more about Syria, what we might have done, what, what, what we can do, what we should be learning. The easiest part of that is what we, what we should have done. When we established red lines, we should have lived up to them, or you don't establish them because you lose the credibility of the international community. And I regret that I was part of an administration that established some red lines, and then they were overstepped, and we didn't do much in response to that. So that's one point. The second point is we got a little holier than thou at the beginning of the process. And what we essentially, when, when this was truly not a civil war, and it, when it was not what it has become now, which I believe is a genocide, it was a political discussion. And we established the principle Assad must leave, period. Once you establish that, game over. Assad knows that in order to maintain power, he has to violate something that the United States has said, and therefore all bets are off. And that was a mistake. So I believe that as well. I also believe that this happened at a very bad time because Americans were so war-weary about Afghanistan and Iraq that this was not a period where we were prepared to engage uh, in the way that we should have. And I would make a parallel again there between the Somalia to Rwanda that where the political will suffered because of a mass reaction of a negative kind. Uh, you know, would, would, and the other part is this is just harder. This is one of the hardest ones because this isn't, uh, you know, a situation where the Syrian government could easily and military could easily be pushed aside as you could have done in any of these other situations. This is a, they had lots of, you know, anti tank weapons, anti aircraft weapons, and so it was a difficult challenge. And so stepping back from all of this, right now, we as civil society actors, and again, I just have to go back to what I said in my presentation, we just have to build this political will. We have to say that the deaths of these individuals are equally an important national security concern as nukes in North Korea, and that the world that we want to live in is peaceful, is prosperous, and respects human dignity and, and human life. And uh, we just have to put the pressure on our, our government leaders. And it can happen. Again, I, I think of Darfur. 
the first uh, one of my closest friends now was the person who started on his college campus, the Save Darfur movement. He ended up then going to work for the vice president. He's now doing incredible work in technology. But I remember that the pressure on the administration that came from that Darfur, free, Save Darfur movement, which is now reflected in a movement called Enough, which is this fabulous group that George Clooney and John Prendergast are supporting. You know, there is political will that, that can be built in these cases. My question is, you know, when was the last time you saw a rally about Syria? I haven't seen any. You know, it's, and, and again, I'll go back to the Rwandan situation. There was no, I mean, people like to say now, oh, I was an early advocate for American engagement. The plane went down on April 6th. The first time any American politician said anything about the possibility of engagement was Paul Simon in mid-June. Already 650 to 700,000 people had died, and that was the first time any member of Congress or any major politician in this country said anything about a possible intervention. So we can't let that happen again. Inadequate response, I recognize, but you're not paying me that much. That was a joke. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is. Yourself for the audience. You're going to be speaking tomorrow as okay. well. <laughs> um, my name is Ka Wala, and I'm a political leader from Cameroon. Um, yeah, I think I'm I'm like the lady in the back with a lot of questions, um, <laughs> um, but I I want to question the idea that we have actually improved. Um, in my neighborhood right now are a minimum of three countries that hit your seven deadly synergies, um, and, and, and I think possibly up to seven. Um, DRC, um, uh, Cameroon. Name them. Too. Yes. <laughs> Cameroon that I come from. Burundi, where I think we as a world have already failed uh, uh, enormously and we continue um, to fail in Burundi. So I, I wonder, uh, uh, you know, if one, I, I, I think that by the time we get to the seven deadly synergies, Sometimes it's too late. And I wonder, should we not be looking at addressing the one fundamental cause, which is dictators that um, are generally at the base of, uh, uh, of, of, of generating these elements? And I wonder also about, um, you've talked about uh, generating political will and, um, um, uh, 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 you know, the, the, the U.S. having moral authority. As an African, I don't feel like I can count on that. I think we need to make a better business case. And I think um, you talked about the impact on your society of these, uh, of, of these uh, mass atrocities. And I think that case has not been made strongly enough to the US, but maybe more strongly so to Europe, which is a lot closer, because I think one of the right. things with the US is you're insulated um, because of distance. Um, when Europe starts seeing millions of refugees on its borders, um, it then thinks, right. you know, so that I, I'm, I, I really feel like we're failing as a world on this question. I wonder how we can, So let me yeah. sort of address the uh, variety of points. Uh, I agree entirely that we haven't done a good enough job connecting the dots for American people. And the one case that I would throw out there that is so obvious that we haven't pursued as an, as a, uh, an explanation here is the case of Ebola. 
Every American hospital everywhere in this friggin' country had to develop a protocol for Ebola. When in reality, there were like 20 cases for the entire country. Do you know the expense that required? Do you know the psychological fear in children about Ebola? Do you know what that caused in terms of Afro-pessimism? You know, we do at World Learning programs where people travel to African countries. We had people who were saying, I'm not going to go to South Africa because there's Ebola in Liberia. We had people saying, Kenya is as far away from Liberia as we are from Liberia right now. And that's probably not right, but it's, uh, it's, it's close enough in this age. Uh, yeah, if it's not true, it should be true. Uh, and yet, it took us so long to say, hey, you know how we can solve this? We can go out to Liberia, to Guinea, and to Cote d'Ivoire, and Sierra Leone, and we can solve it there, and game over, end of problem. The amount of cost when we did that was so much less and if you think about the impact on the world, so much more useful. So we need to remind our people of, of that. We also, it's also very interesting that the members of Congress who are most supportive of engagement in prevention exercises are those who represent districts that have military bases in them. I know that sounds weird because they tend to be, you know, southern states where you'd think that they were anti-foreign aid, but it's true. And it's because they know that American soldiers and American spouses don't want to see us get to the point where we have to send forces onto the ground in these situations. So I agree entirely with that. Uh, I, I actually disagree with you that political repression is the only factor here. Uh, I, I, I am completely in agreement that dictatorships are bad and that there is there does tend to be a correlation between where genocides and mass atrocities occur and dictatorships, but the link is not as causally significant, and I wish uh, 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 Valentino was still here because he, he is actually doing research on this, and so I hope you'll talk with him. But, uh, but no, I, I'm not going to sit here and defend a Robert Mugabe or a, uh, or a Museveni, you know, who are abusing their population, but I just don't think it's as determinate a factor as other things are. I agree with you, we're isolated. You know, 9-11, I, I, in a weird sort of way, connected us more with the global community because we finally realized that, you know, oceans don't protect you the way you thought they did in the past. And uh, again, Johnny was very much a part of this, but we saw a doubling of aid to Africa in the years after 9-11. In fact, we made a commitment at Glen Eagles to double aid from 2005 to 2010, specifically designed for the reasons that you're talking about, and specifically designed to create resiliency and stability so that we didn't see every bad election turn into mass atrocities, and we didn't see every drought turn into a famine. Uh, so I'm, I'm in full agreement with you on those points, and I look forward to your lecture tomorrow. So, please. Um, this is a question that can go on for a long time also, but um, like two or three points. <laughs> can you speak to what makes a leader, experiences or qualities? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think empathy is probably the best, the ability to put yourself in other people's positions, to be able to see what's on their minds. I mean, look at a Nelson Mandela. 
Nelson Mandela got to know his jail, jailers better than they knew themselves. And he understood when he came out of prison what the Afrikaner mindset was. He knew that the Kosa community had uh, been accused of arrogance, and so vis-a-vis -vis the Zulus and the other the Swanas and the Sutus, he understood what they were thinking. He recognized a sense of pragmatism, and I'm ultimately I'm 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 very much a pragmatist. And in his mind, this wasn't as much a question of social justice and of rights. It was a question of what was going to work to get the South Africans together in a, in a noble process. And I don't know, we were just talking about this before, before this lecture. He was willing to allow the whites to have a whites-only election to decide whether they were going to go ahead with the compromises needed to end apartheid. This was, this was absolutely crazy to be able to say to your oppressors who put you in prison for 26 years, who had resulted in more deaths and suffering in your community than you could ever imagine, yes, I am letting you have one last vote to say whether we're going to go ahead with racial justice in this country. It was amazing. And it passed with about 75%, and he knew it was going to pass. But he, you know, the, the picture of him with the Springboks cap on, he was vilified because rugby is a white sport in South Africa. Soccer is the black sport in South Africa. And he would cared more about the rugby team and send every message to the white community. You know, I mentioned that the election that took place in the, that very first election, Nelson Mandela won with 69% of the vote. However, if he had won with 69% of the vote, he could have changed the Constitution by himself. And so he actually negotiated a decline in his percentage from 69 to 63. I know that sounds weird, but he basically said, anybody who has a protest against a vote, I'm not going to challenge it. And the protests that we have against vote fixing in your community, we're just going to let it go. He knew that to have the majority and the ability to go back on the agreements was going to be so psychologically impactful on the white community and on the Zulu community with Butelese in particular, that he didn't want that. And so he voluntarily gave it up. I mean, this is, this is what leadership is. Leadership is knowing, having a vision for your society, having the empathy and the understanding of other people's motivations, and the willingness to sacrifice for that purpose. I can stay all night, by the way, but obviously people are. So you made a very powerful point about the false promises of am amnesty and in some instances. And one thing I know that you had mentioned was the potential of trying like war criminals or people who commit crimes against humanity in the ICC. But I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that the United States, for example, is not a member of the ICC. And there's been like recent talk of the, an African exodus from the court. And I know recently the Philippines has also been talking about that. So I guess my question is, how do we keep the international community accountable in, in a world in, um, in which countries don't really regard that institution. And I shouldn't say, all, obviously, countries in general, but an increasing number of countries don't regard that institution with the respect they should. So that, that's a fascinating question. And uh, I was smiling because when I first left the Obama administration, I gave a speech on transitional justice. And I was a bit essentially asked the same question. And I had not yet developed my post-government freedom. 
And so I gave, you the, I gave that person the answer from the talking points of the State Department, which I don't believe in. You know, I felt like a lion who was in a cage, and they opened the door, and I was afraid to come out. But I will tell you the answer that I believe. We made a very serious mistake when we allowed concerns from a very small number of senators about the potential impact of this on American service members abroad to have us unsign the Rome Statute and then basically not push ahead with it. I wish we had pushed ahead with it because, frankly, we have ample opportunities to express our sovereignty in the world. But when we are out of step with the rest of the global community, you do see what is going on with country after country rejecting uh, the, uh, the, uh, the court. And you're right, this is a real concern in Africa, because with the exception of the Bosnia and former Yugoslavia situation, virtually everyone who's been brought before, whether it's Charles Taylor, whether it's warlords in eastern Congo, whether it's Kenyans, whether it's uh, Bashir, who hasn't been brought forward, but he has been indicted, uh, they're all Africans. And you're seeing the uh, less politically uh, liberal forces in Africa basically saying this is anti-us, which is crazy. I mean, to, to say you're going to go after you know, Charles Taylor, who has killed more Africans because of his activities, and to say that that is an anti-African initiative to bring him to the criminal court, I mean, I, I think that's nuts. But you're right, as long as we're not part of it, and as long as we're saying our national sovereignty means more to us than a, a adherence to this provision, you're right, it is a challenge. Now, I think we, frankly, hit the peak of that because now you're seeing governments throughout Africa stepping back from that anti-ICC uh, movement. You're seeing civil society come forward and a lot of great lawyers' organizations and a lot of great human rights organizations from Africa itself are stepping forward in that area as well. So I'm a little less worried right now, but it is a serious problem, and I don't really have a, the, the final answer for it. Thanks. Thanks, Corlin. <laughs> um, no, I'm not. I'm going to ask one. Um, about, I think it was about three years ago. I'm um, uh, so every year the Friends Committee on National Legislation, which is the advocacy and lobbying arm of the Society of Friends, the Quakers, has a lobby day um, in Washington. And about three years ago, I was down there. And we were lobbying um, in support of the Atrocities Prevention Board to continue it and to um, continue funding. And I was very, I mean, I didn't know who the aides were in people's offices, but found out that a good number of them are affected from the Department of Defense or state. And so these people, all I mean, bipartisan support was very strong for the um, board. My question is, um, what is it like now? And what is it going to be like with John Bolton as the national security? So you, you preempted my comment, because I was going to say so far so good. <laughs> because indeed, I've had conversations with Gary Hall, who is the successor in effect to Samantha Power. And he, he likes the Atrocity Prevention Board. He sees it as a place that can generate real ideas that can focus again on countries that aren't on the regular radar screen. Because as I said in my comments, 
I am not worried about the global community you know, paying attention to Syria. We are paying attention. We're not doing what we need to do, but we are paying attention. We are paying attention to South Sudan. But what's happening in the Northern Triangle in Central America? What's happening in the Central African Republic, which was my first assignment in my career? And let me guarantee you that there are bad things happening there and we are not paying ample attention to. So he loves the fact that this is a little bit of a canary in the coal mine that is going to be able to keep us focused on these issues. Uh, they also, frankly, you know, the, the internal logic of the thing is so strong because what, what you normally find when you go through a National Security Council meeting, if you look at the agenda, you know, you'll go through peace, war, et cetera, power sharing, whatever, and then you get down to the bottom, and then it's these kinds of issues, because these are considered the soft issues. You know, and it's, it's amazing, and you never get there. And so the point is, you need some internal group that's going to be addressing them. John Bolton, all bets are off. I am, and I, I think I can say this personally, I am more scared right now than I've been for a long time because I know this man, and he is not committed to human rights. He is not committed to even what I believe is rational thinking in terms of an exercise of American national security interests. I think, and, and unfortunately for me, when I was working with him at the State Department, Colin Powell didn't listen to him, but I'm afraid the president will. So I'm, I am nervous, and I, I'm particularly nervous on this agenda as well. Are you going to reprimand me? I don't. But, okay, let's do Pooja and then Dan and maybe wrap it up at that just point. A, just a quick question. Um, it seems to me the takeaway is that American foreign policy in, from a strategic standpoint is abysmal when it comes to the African continent uh, based on the tone, tonality and, you know, what, what's in the public uh, discourse in the public square. And in light of that, assuming that's true or at least partially true, as a diplomat, what do you think the impacts will be in light of the rise of China? Is China influencing American behaviors uh, strategically? Uh, just your thoughts on that. So I'm going to give a very quick response, and then I'm going to ask Johnny to respond, because Johnny, you have the former Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, a former ambassador in a number of different settings, and a professor here who teaches these issues. And so it would be arrogant for me to try to answer. But I, I wanted to address the first part of that question, though, because I am an Afro-optimist, uh, absolutely. I do not believe that the continent is, ha is destined for poverty, destined for disease. If you look at the growth rates in Africa economically, it is amazing. We have 5 and 6% growth rates throughout the vast majority of countries in that continent. We have seen a massive decline in infant mortality over the last 20 years. We've seen a massive decline in deaths from measles and malaria. We've seen progress in democratization on the continent. We have more democracies in Africa right now than we ever have in the history of the continent. We have seen leaders who in many countries accept the role of civil society, and you've seen this outburst of civil society engagement. I am an Afro-optimist, and I believe that the other, the other point is, yes, I think right now we have a very big challenge because this administration doesn't care about most of the issues that the African community cares about. But I would also tell you that you're seeing a proliferation of civil society engagement from the United States, church groups. You're seeing private sector investment. You're seeing universities that are forming linkages with African universities all throughout the, the world. You're seeing this incredible growth 
of a global community that is going to bode extremely well for this continent. Uh, and I have spent about half my adult life on the continent working there. And I can't tell you how hopeful I am about the future there. Johnny, seriously. This is... <laughs> no, no I, I, I absolutely uh, agree uh, with you, Don. Just l let me just add one point. Uh, there has been a strong bipartisan consensus uh, in favor of support for uh, Africa uh, across uh, both Democratic and Republican administrations over the last 25 years. And while there is a sharp decline in interest uh, in the current White House uh, and uh, State Department, uh, the bipartisan consensus uh, on Capitol Hill among Democrats and Republicans remains uh, very strong. Uh, one of the strongest champions on the Republican side is the current uh, House uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Committee Chairman, Ed Royce, from California, supported by both uh, a number of Democrats and Republicans uh, in the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and in the uh, Senate, uh, you see also a strong uh, bipartisan support for uh, Africa. I think that consensus will uh, remain strong, uh, irrespective of the lack of interest uh, that is currently exhibited uh, by, uh, by the current administration. Uh, we also have to recognize that China uh, is, uh, in fact, a rising global uh, power with uh, international and global interests, including in, uh, in Africa. They take a long-term uh, strategic approach uh, to uh, issues around the world, including in, in Africa. Uh, it means for us that uh, we have to continue to remain engaged uh, and to uh, step up our game in terms of our own commitment to the continent and to uh, recognize its continuing growing uh, significance and importance. I guess the only thing I'd add is just one sentence, which is, in a lot of ways, I'm really happy that Africa uh, is attracting the interest of China. You're seeing more capital go in. You're seeing more investment. You're seeing a lot of opportunities for development. The downside is what is the motivation for it, and too frequently it is to get either access to uh, petroleum or other natural resources. And then the third question is what is the impact, because you, we all know that there are a number of countries that as long as we've got some economic pressure on we can drive them or help drive them in a positive direction. I'm thinking for Angola for one country uh, where they were suffering very badly despite the production of 2 million barrels of oil. They had sold all their oil for the future and they were on the, on the brink of having to come to a very good agreement with the World Bank and the international community and then China came in with billions of dollars worth of investment and game over. So yeah, you do need to think about motivation as well as positive and negative impacts. Thanks. Um, one quick piece to on. There we go. Um, <clears throat> one quick question and, and we should probably wrap this up, but I want to thank you, first of all, for a fabulous presentation. Okay, all right, we'll be here till dinner, but that's okay. Um, so the story you told was, um, you know, focused uh, to a large extent on uh, the understandings that a particular set of leaders and their particular characteristics had in particular circumstances. You know, there's that great old line uh, from Kierkegaard that we we live life going forward, we understand it looking backward. And so uh, my fear is that um, particularly as the memory of the Holocaust, which had such an important role in motivating so many to advocate at atrocity prevention, 
as that fades, how do we uh, create that sense in uh, civil society um, that this is a requirement going forward? Because if you're always relying on the on the leaders, you know, political circumstances, you're you're going to get it right one out of three, one out of four times. I fear. Yeah, I, I worry about that a lot, and I don't have an answer for your question. Uh, it, in all seriousness, it only occurred to me maybe 15, 20 years ago that I was born eight years after Buchenwald uh, because that seems like such ancient history, even for me. And if you then look at a person who was born in the 80s or 90s, they're looking at Rwanda as if that's, you know, I, I, for, for us, for my generation, it was so searing. And if you talk to Madeleine Albright, which I do frequently, she will tell you it is the single worst mistake that she made in her entire diplomatic career to assume that we had to yank the international peacekeepers there. And yet, the vast majority of, you know, our, uh, of our world was born well after that. You know, my 14-year-old my son likes to say, you know, young people are 25% of the population and 100% of the future. And, you know, it is, you know, we're, we're almost at the point, I would assume, that there are no Holocaust survivors around. There, there are some. But, you know... We're talking about, what, 72 years ago, so you would have had to be a very young child. You're right. That's why it is absolutely vital that we keep the Holocaust Museum, that we keep the Auschwitz Institute for Atrocity Prevention, which I'm a member of. It's absolutely essential that we teach it in our schools. And that's why I'm so delighted that the Coens, in particular, were the people who drove that process here in New Hampshire to make sure that it's a requirement in public schools to teach. But the other thing that I think we're learning is it isn't the Holocaust. It is Syria. It is, I mean, it's, it's right in front of our eyes in Rakhine province and, and Harp and... Uh, uh, Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. It's there. Genocide is occurring before our eyes. And unless we can connect the dots, and that's our job, Dan, our job is, is to connect the dots, to say that there is a relationship not only between what's going on in those situations and our moral authority and our economic and political interests in this country, but there's also a connection between the elimination of extreme poverty, the creation of good leaders, the fight for human rights, and mass atrocities. I keep giving these inadequate answers, but this is not a place where they're definitive. So, toughest question. <laughs> My question is actually really similar, and I think you talked a lot about building domestic political will. Um, and I was wondering, like, especially even in class, we talked about kind of misconceptions about how much money is going abroad and what we're doing. Um, and then especially with the new administration, like, what would you recommend that we do, especially other students who are entering the space um, after graduation to kind of build that political will? And do you think there's a role for kind of new technologies in that as well? Yeah, and, and there absolutely is. I mentioned uh, the person who started the Save Darfur movement, Mark Hanus. He has now gotten funding to create uh, a technological advocacy network. And so if you care about climate change, you log on to this particular uh, site, you type in what you care about, and all of a sudden draft letters to congressmen, associations that you should be supporting in your local community and globally, 
politicians who are supportive of your views emerges immediately. And it's like, uh, you know, uh, Advocacy 101. And he's got it funded. He's getting it going right now. So yes, absolutely, there is a role for, for technology in this space. Uh, I also believe that we have a responsibility for education. And, you know, I, I actually am a Platonian or whatever, the, 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 that old thing about the cave and the people who can actually see the flame. We have a responsibility to say, yes, that is a flame. It's not just the reflection that you're seeing. That, that to me, is what this is all about. Because we're in an elite institution right here. Let's not forget, even though we wear blue jeans, this is Ivy League. And we have a responsibility to connect what we are privileged to learn to teach the average American. And that is a little bit elitist, I get it. But that's, I believe, part of this, this exercise. You know, we were given good educations. We were given proper food, et cetera. You know, 40% of Africa in certain areas, kids are stunted by the time they're five years old. They have no chance. They are hardwired for failure. We're not there. And we have to use that moral responsibility to, to help others see the same challenges that we see. That's a good place to stop. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.